ideas worth spreading. That's what TED's about. And I am going to share with you an idea uh, that has emerged over my 62 years. And the ideas, I'm very interested in how even ideas come into me, yet how they move, how they stay, how they um, don't do anything at all. And at the fact that they have power and they shape us. And I'm going to begin with an idea that I think we need to reconsider and probably discard. And I want to take just a half a second about the speed with which we do things as being potentially dangerous area that we have yet to consider. That pile of books that you see over on the stage there are a number of books that I have read cover to cover over the uh, last four or five years. They have shaped what you're hearing today. So in a sense, today is a distillation of that and everything else into 15 minutes, now 14 based on the timer up here. So let's move on and see if, if this actually works. The next slide. I think the dominant framework by which, the dominant idea by which we have been educated and by which we operate in our culture today is this one, where you have these three parts that are separated. They're distinct pieces. In higher education, we put them in different colleges or we put them in different disciplines. And I would argue even further that on our culture, they're not equal, that the economy always wins. It's why when you want to do something, the answer often is, oh, we can't afford to do that. And so I want to tell you why I think that idea has to be discarded. Whoops, we went the wrong way. Let's try it this way. This is a graph from the ecological footprint, a tool that measures the ability of the earth that we have, that ground, that land that can provide us food and all the things we need to live, and the way that we are spending it up. About the mid-1980s, I can do this right, Whoops, we went too far. We'll go back. Dun, 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 dun. There. About the mid-1980s, we got, we got to we were spending down uh, the interest, and we started buying into the capital of evolution for a long time. If you see the trajectory that goes up in that way, by 2050, at current rates, we're going to be at that place. We're going to need more than two planets, and we don't have more than two planets. There's a line there that shows that we could take a change of direction, and if we do, we can get down towards that one planet uh, ability of the Earth to do what we need to do. Another issue with the ecological footprint, though, is that our footprints are not equal. So there are issues here that deal with justice and fairness, not only in what we have put into the atmosphere in terms of greenhouse gases, but also the outcomes of the deterioration of the environmental fabric that holds us together uh, will fall unequally. Bangladesh, which has about half the population of the United States, is very near or at sea level. If sea level rises, they're going to see the brunt of that more than the rest of us. This comes from a report that most people sitting in this room have never heard about. It's called the UN Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, done in 2005. 1,300 scientists from around the world studied the status of our health of the ecosystems across the whole thing. And you see from the slide that the majority, not all, but the majority of all our ecosystems are in decline. Enough environmental bad news, you say. So we move on to this. The way that we have measured, traditionally, economists have us measure the wealth of our society and our prosperity is through that line that goes up in this very same parallel line as we saw in the ecological footprint. That's called the gross domestic product. But the bottom line is something called uh, the genuine progress indicator, which looks at a range of things, not just our economic dollars and cents in our wallet, but our health, uh, our access to education, our security from feeling that we're going to be robbed every 15 minutes. And you can see that that flattened out about the time of Jimmy Carter and hasn't gotten any better. And that's US focus, by the way. It gets more complicated, though. You've seen these things more and more now, thanks and a lot to the Occupy movement. But this is from the global family. That's called the Champagne Glass from about 2007. That's a concentration of wealth across nations. The, uh, if we were to do one of the United States, you'd see that it's more, even more intense in some areas. So we have some real issues of inequality, so much so that a recent task force from the American Political Science Association, which I just saw finally posted in the last couple of weeks, has said that the income inequality and the lack of democracy that feeds off of that is probably as big a threat as climate change. This comes from the happiness indicator. Are we any more happy? This is a survey done every year since the end of World War II. 
We reached our peak happiness here in the United States via this survey about the time of Ozzie and Harriet, for those of you old enough to remember Ozzie and Harriet, back when we only had those three networks. And, uh, but it's, it's stabilized out. It has not uh, gone any further uh, in terms of our happiness, even though our gross national product and our incomes have gone up more. Uh, finally, uh, in this gloom and dooms part of the talk, uh, there's a book that came out by two British um, epidemiologists uh, about three or four years ago. And they studied what is the difference in advanced societies, those societies that have less crime, that have or more crime or more poverty, more uh, uh, infant mortality, uh, infant mortality or uh, age length and those kinds of things that get into the genuine progress indicator. And study after study after study, when they plotted these out, and these were hundreds of studies, show that the big determinant that crosses all of those things is income inequality. Uh, and it is something that, thanks again to the Occupy people, uh, we're starting to talk a little bit about. So what I want to do is move to what I think are the emergent new ideas, the ideas worth spreading. Let's shred that idea for a minute or put it on the back burner and think about this. This is the idea that most people, when they use the word sustainability, and I was a sustainability director at Michigan State for 10 years, uh, talk about this sense where we now we think about those three sectors as being connected and that those three sectors are in fact balanced. And uh, sometimes we refer to that balance as the triple bottom line. That's language that the business world tends to use because they think of bottom lines. That what they're doing and when they use this is we're talking about bottom lines that are not just dollars in our pockets. And it talks really about the language about taking care of the present needs of current generations as well as future generations. And I think it's great. But in my own evolution of thinking, and my evolution of thinking I hope is not done because uh, the world continues to change and we have to change and shift with it, uh, takes us to another version of sustainability, which I see as much deeper. It's called the prism of sustainability. It was developed by the uh, Wuppertal Institute in uh, Germany. And it, it adds the same kinds of things. If I could do this without flicking the thing, there is a uh, thing here. It adds the uh, environmental and the economic and the social, but it's got this participatory element to it that is fundamentally important. And you've heard that in a couple of the TED Talks that we've had before us. It uses words like care and justice. And these are the components that need to come, I think, into the mode of what we're discussing in terms of the future. And to realize that it's all connected uh, and that there are many avenues into this. As you're hearing from the TED Talks today, there's different angles into this, but we're all connected in a very complex web. And it's beginning to understand that at a level that's beyond just intellectually knowing it by reading books. So what is the future? The future is uncertain. We, I think we can pretty much agree to that. If we knew what the stock market was doing tomorrow and which companies were gonna prosper, we'd all put our money there, wouldn't we? Because then it would be safe, but we don't know. We don't know exactly what's gonna go on with climate change, though the science tells us we have serious reasons of concern and we might wanna be doing something about it. We also know that we don't know enough because these systems are so complex even in themselves and you throw in the human element to it, it becomes even more complex. And so what do we do? Well, we think, I think, this is my idea, that we need some necessary ingredients and we need to make these ingredients available to everybody. One, we must learn together. It must be social learning. Uh, there is nobody on this planet or on this stage that's smart enough to have this figured out. That we need to develop systems because of our uncertainty, because of our woeful lack of knowledge that are flexible and adaptable. If we build huge centralized places and they fail, the cost of redoing them is enormous. And then finally, maybe the most important part of the idea is a realization that we're all in this together. It is distinctive from our economic model and what we're hearing from Washington on both sides of the aisle, that somehow we can do this by a selfish description of what is possible. So these are the ways I think we get there. We need to free the imagination. We need to get out of the idea that there is no alternative. It's what we hear all the time when we throw up a new idea. If it's not, we can't afford it. It's though there's no alternative. We're stuck with doing it the way we've been doing it. We need to humanize others, everybody. And you've heard that in three or four of the talks already this morning. We need to question the contradictions as we show those graphs. And we, we have to stare at those and say that I've been believing that for such a long time, but maybe I should look at that a little more carefully. And then we need to have all voices present. 
and they need to be heard and they need to be respected and they need to be invited into the room. Competition came up in the last uh, <coughs> kinetic uh, action there about the competition. And our, our model of our economy is built on competition to the exclusion that I think it's the only part of what humans are. And we've built a system on an honoring competition as the powerful engine driver. And it has had some of that effect, but it has incredible costs. And it also denies part of what makes us human. And that is the collaborative, the love, the other parts of us. And so we need to move into uh, efforts that are of that year. This is the UN uh, year of, of cooperatives, by the way. This transfers into how we talk to each other. The presidents, you know, candidates, Romney evidently and o Obama and maybe some third parties are gonna debate, which means they're gonna try to pick my ideas are better than your ideas. And that is not productive because we need emergent ideas that are better than the sum of those two parts or the winner take all possibilities. So we need to be able to create the conditions that allow us to have those spaces where emergent ideas can be born. TEDx does this. That's why I'm thrilled to be part of this whole thing. And then there's the individual responsibility that I think we have. We, we're kind of taught uh, to be disempowered that we can't change anything. And you're hearing these voices, everybody up here, previous me today and probably everybody after, and many of you in the audience are making change every day. Uh, it's the fun part, especially when you're doing it with others. Uh, but I want you to know you're not alone. In this community, this is just a handful of the organizations that are doing wonderful work, and most of them are not profit-based. Uh, social entrepreneurship is probably the fastest growing global movement that there is, uh, and it's really easy to get involved in these kinds of things. It's where you get enrichment. I tell students when I talk to students, you want to find a life partner, go volunteer on something you really believe in, and you're going to be working next to somebody who's also committed to that. It's like Glenn was saying in the, his very first talk about how an idea owns us. If that idea owns us and moves us in that direction, we're going to connect necessarily with others. There are also organizations doing this all over the world. I've pulled out just a couple here, the Center for the New American Dream and the Bioneers, which, uh, which bring people together to explore the possibilities and create those conditions for us so we don't even have to leave our armchairs in some cases. And maybe more importantly than all, I keep saying that, but what's more important, uh, this idea of democracy. Tom Attlee wrote this book a, a few years ago called The Dao of Democracy, which really looks at democracy a lot deeper uh, and how it works at the small group level as well as how it could impact and change how we do things within government and beyond government. We are only in an infantile stage of understanding what democracy could look like. Uh, and there are people out there, the National Council for Dialogue and Deliberation has hundreds of people every day trying to figure out how to do this better. So you don't have to start from scratch. And there are great tools out there that allow us to do that. This is one, it's called the Change Handbook. It's one of the books, so I, I don't think I brought that one. But it's got all these different processes that are tried in various groups and various settings for various designed outcomes in hopes that uh, we can find our way to this better world. And I think that idea is possible. Matter of fact, I feel it living and breathing. I feel that it moves me. It's the idea that's kind of captivated me, given the necessities of the calamities of the growing income inequality and the climate and ecological devastation that is going to be forced upon our forebears. I'll close with this slide. The guy in the middle back there is a guy named Satish Kumar, who I was fortunate enough to meet a few years ago. I had him speak at Michigan State University. Uh, during the Cold War, he walked all the way around the earth uh, with another guy most of the way to protest the uh, nuclear weapons that were being held in Moscow. So he went to every capital. He walked uh, uh, every capital uh, that had nuclear weapons at that time and tried to speak to the leaders about getting away with nuclear weapons. He then started, uh, uh, later on he got involved, he started Schumacher College now over in England and has been the publisher and editor of uh, the first and maybe still the best sustainability magazine in the world. It's called Resurgence. Uh, and this is a group of him walking. Uh, this is from an African proverb. If you want to walk fast, walk alone. If you want to walk far, walk together. My big idea we're sharing is that we have to begin to think in the head and in the heart and with the hands that this is one single planet. We don't got another one coming up anytime soon. We are one 
human family and our future is wedded together. Thank you very much.